What kind of world do I want to live in? I think about this question a lot. For our generation and for specifically my group of people, which is refugees, the circumstances might dismantle any vision of the future that we have. You're trying to rebuild, you're trying to make a future for yourself, and then the climate related disaster comes and you start again. It's not about how it's affecting you now, it's about how it's affecting you your entire life. First step to understand is that we're all a part of it. None of us are going to be left out by the crisis. We're at a stage where if we don't act now, really there won't be very much left. There are generations that will never see certain things that we grew up seeing in real life. We have to start treating this like the emergency it is. To achieve the 17 Sustainable Development Goals, we have to go from an intention to a serious commitment. Business leaders really need to rethink how they conduct their business and invest in creating systems that are climate friendly. Action I would like to see is accountability. Structures being put in place where countries aren't just asked to do something, but they're kept accountable to the decisions that they make. There has to be that strong collaboration between government, between corporations, between youth activists to drive change forward. The world I would want to live in is a world where imagining the future is not a privilege. I want to live in a world where people do not give up on hope, hope that a positive change is possible. The fact that you're listening today means that you are willing to make a change. to this uh, excellent panel we've got for the next 45 minutes entitled Global Economic Outlook. And uh, I'm sure, as you're all very, very aware, any panel with that title can go in multiple directions. We're not going to have enough time in 45 minutes to go through every piece of minutiae in the global economy. But I can tell you, we have got an absolutely excellent panel of economists uh, who are going to just talk through some of the biggest issues as they see it as well. We're going to talk for around about 25 minutes uh, with those economists, and then you, the audience, will have ample opportunities, should you so wish, uh, to get involved in what will be a, an interactive discussion as well. Now, you can put your questions in uh, through the usual channels, a Slido or questions on the screen, as you can see them. I think you can put them in via the chat and what have you. Thought. I will get those questions, and I will get the, those questions to the economists uh, if you should so ask questions. Now, the panel, I will tell you, in no particular order, is a fantastic one. We have Dirk Jan Omzik, who is the Chief Economist at the United Nations Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs. Uh, he's joining us from New York. Very good to see you this afternoon, uh, Dirk Jan. Razia Khan is the uh, Head of Research, Chief Economist, African Middle East at Standard Chartered Bank, joining us from the exotic location of West London, an even more exotic location of Wiltshire, I think he's pretty much there. That is Paul Donovan, an old friend of mine, Global Chief Economist at UBS Wealth Management. Um, this will be a good conversation, I can tell you, because one of the aforementioned economists has said to me on many occasions, who started a conversation on many occasions, if only it Economists ran the world, and then you, the audience, can fill in the gap. But if only economists, I won't tell you who, who said that, but I, all I can say is he works for a Swiss bank. Right, okay, so let's just get through some of the details as well. The world economic recovery is taking hold at the moment. I've got the IMF latest publication on my screen. It says 6% growth in 2021, 4.9% growth in 2022. But this is the key message. Vaccine access has emerged as the principal fault line along which the global recovery splits into two blocks. Those that can look forward to further normalization of activity later this year, almost all of the advanced economies, and those that will face resurgent infections and rising COVID death tolls. There are many, many questions we have in this panel, but one I think is to find out where we are now, 
and what are the opportunities going forward, what are the risks going forward, and how a collective recovery is this, or how a divisive recovery is this as well. So with that in mind, I'm going to go in no particular order to our panel now and, and uh, for an opening round of questions. And I will go to Paul Donovan first, if I may. He's the Global Chief Economist, as I mentioned, at UBS Wealth Management. Uh, Paul, can you give us a, a broad brush of where you see we're at now compared to perhaps where we were a year ago and where you think we are going on this global economic recovery? Good morning to you, my friend, or good afternoon, I should say. Afternoon. Well, I'm very much of the view that, that we didn't have, in any conventional sense, a recession in 2020. And we're not having, in any conventional sense, a recovery right now. What we had, actually, I think that the closest parallel is France's Grand Vacances where obviously in, in August, traditionally, um, you see a, a big drop in economic activity as everybody takes holiday. And then you get this sudden resurgence of activity, a very abrupt uh, move back to activity as people return in September. And I think that that sort of binary process, rather than the, the more classic gradual uh, descent and recovery cycle, is what we're experiencing. Um, and so as soon as we've seen restrictions be eased, we have seen consumption take place. Uh, and that consumption in developed markets, though not so much in emerging markets, has been fueled by the accumulated savings uh, that were forced on people in 2020. And so it's given us a very strong, very consumer-focused period of economic bounce back, which has been very abrupt uh, and has led to some extraordinary demand levels. So in the States, for example, um, uh, non-auto durable goods demand is about 25% above trend. I mean, it's astonishingly strong. Uh, and that, of course, is coming from two factors. Firstly, this accumulated pot of savings. And secondly, the fact that people have tended to spend on goods rather than on services, at least in the first wave of, of coming back. Overall, then, that's given us a strong global bounce back this year. Uh, I think that some of the momentum of that will carry into next year, particularly as not all economies, as you were saying, are coming back at the same time. So we've seen Broadly, the Anglo-Saxon economy is leading. Europe is about six months behind. Emerging markets have tended to be selling into that consumer strength. So trade has recovered very, very quickly, uh, and it's selling into the consumption demand of Western Europe and the United States. Um, I think, therefore, that we continue to see strong growth, but we have to accept that the really exceptional growth levels – that we had earlier this year are not going to continue. Paul, I'm going to get this question to you straight away. It's something that you and I have debated a lot over the last year as well. Are we seeing real inflation coming through? I know what you think, but why don't you share it with our audience? So we're not. Um, so inflation is a general rise in prices, lots of prices rising in the economy, because that tells you that there is an imbalance in the economy which needs to be resolved. And we are simply not seeing that at the moment. What we have or what we have had is very narrow inflation. So one or two goods prices rising, one or two services rising. And it's not the job of central bankers to intervene in a specific product market. You know, Fed Chair Powell is not a used car salesperson. Um, Fed Chair Powell cannot influence the price of used cars in the United States. And there's no way he should put the economy into an economic downturn just because the price of a Honda Civic from 2001 is rising at 45% a year. So we have here this very specific nature. And what I think is very significant is that we're starting to see that reverse. The moment demand starts to fade, price competition is really re-exerting itself. So again, in the States, airfares have been a big part of the uh, inflation spike on the headline CPI. As we have seen uh, demand for air travel start to fade back a bit, we've immediately gone into price competition and we're rapidly moving into a disinflation phase, which I think actually will come deflation as far as airfares are concerned. So I don't think we've got a general inflation problem. I think we've got some specific imbalances in certain product markets. In some cases, 
that's being met with just simply delays in delivery. You just got to wait for it. In other cases, there is an attempt to ration demand using the price mechanism, which temporarily pushes up prices. But I think the, the, the evidence is now pretty overwhelming. This is a temporary spike in terms of headline CPI. OK, I will ask you later on whether you managed to sell that 2001 Honda Civic, because I know you've been trying to flog it for a very long time, Paul. Uh, let's get to Razia Khan. Razia, um, lovely to uh, see all your notes beforehand. And, and, and what I thought was very interesting from Paul, I, I, and, and this is no criticism, I wonder if he was talking very much about the developed world. Um, and so let me ask you, is the emerging market recovering at the same pace? Are we seeing the vaccination progress that we need to see so that the rest of the world can be reassured that the emerging market crisis is not going to create a global crisis going forward. And just with a reference point, I was staggered to see just one of the latest pieces of data now, Razia, is that only 32% of the population globally uh, have been vaccinated. And you compare that to some of the numbers, for instance, in the United Kingdom, 67% of the population, Japan, 53%, the United States, 55%. So clearly a lot of emerging uh, markets, emerging economies, are lagging behind. But what about that compared to the kind of growth that Paul was talking about? This is probably the most significant threat to global growth, to the global growth outlook that we see on the horizon. And for the very key fact that we have seen a great divergence in terms of the amounts of vaccines administered, the percentage of populations in different regions have been able to access those vaccines. You gave those very stark numbers about emerging markets. I wonder how many would realize that if we were to look at specific markets, sub-Saharan Africa, for example, the numbers are far, far lower than that. Not so long ago, we were talking about around 3% of the adult population having been fully vaccinated. That's a stark difference from the record that we see elsewhere. So the big question is this. We heard very compellingly the story from Paul around the developed markets recovery, that nice analogy that it seemed a little bit like in August in France when consumption was temporarily lower, households were able to save a lot when developed markets, and we are really talking about developed markets reopened, we saw a lot of the spending of that accumulated unintended savings. We saw stronger recoveries as part of that um, emergence from the COVID lockdowns. And of course, while there's no expectation that that kind of growth rate is sustained, it wasn't a bad starting point. For many emerging markets, for sub-Saharan African countries in particular, the outlook is very different. The reality is we are nowhere near making fast enough progress on the pace of vaccine administration that we need to do. The big concern, of course, is what does this ultimately mean for the global economy? What we've seen from financial markets to date is that any time there have been fears around new variants, the Delta variant most recently, it's knocked back a great deal of that optimism. And the fact remains that for as long as a large proportion of the global population remains unvaccinated, we don't really have those safeguards in place against new variants emerging, against some of that optimism that has been carefully cultivated, policy no doubt has helped, some of that being lost entirely. And this is the point about the very divergent path of the global economy. We can't take for granted at all that one part of the global economy recovers, one part of the global economy has access to vaccines, the other does not, the recovery lags well behind, but there are risks to everyone if we don't get this right. Expand upon that. I think a lot of people in the markets today that are selling off, and I speak with the NASDAQ down 2%, the S&P 500 down 1.6%, they're worried about the United States. They're worried uh, about the inflationary issues that Paul was talking about, about tapering. They're worried about China growth today and Evergrande debt, and we'll come on to debt, importantly, with you and Dirk Yan especially, uh, a little bit later on. But what is the threat we are talking about from emerging market low vaccination rates to the developed world? 
Well, a great deal of the optimism that we saw reflected in financial markets was based on the belief that with the vaccine administration success in developed markets, at least a certain core part of the global economy, and the same can now be said of China as well, has been able to put the COVID crisis behind it. The reopening can happen relatively safely. We know that if 70% of the adult population is vaccinated, as we're now seeing in China, even if there are new COVID cases, even if there are new contained measures that are being implemented in certain parts of China, it's not going to derail economic growth. Now, let's park the Evergrande issues for now, because that's an entirely different set of concerns. But the question is, how safe can we be in that belief that we have put the COVID crisis properly behind us if we still have the risk that large proportions of the global population remain unvaccinated? What safeguard is there in place to suggest that we're not going to see the emergence of new variants that could call into question the effectiveness of what we already have? How do we know that we don't go back to the very starting point of all of this, having to fight new battles against the emergence of COVID and new variants. Ultimately, it's been said a great deal of times that we're not all safe until all of us have been vaccinated. And nowhere has that held more true than on a global scale. Now, it is the case that we're not seeing the same synchronized slowdown in global GDP that we saw in 2020. Even when new COVID containment measures have needed to be implemented, they're being implemented against a backdrop where more activity is still continuing and is protected. The bounce back in growth in developed markets, the robust growth that we had seen from China earlier, all of this has helped. It's helped commodity producers the world around. The fact that you are seeing this lift to growth in some of the world's economy no doubt helps prospects for everyone. But we need to be careful about how we're going to be managing those risks going forward. That's brilliant. Um, Dirk Jan, I know that you will echo a lot of what uh, Razia just said, but let me come to you on the financing angle straight away, because I think a couple of bullet points that overlap really succinctly as well. I spent a lot of time this year, I was down at G7 in Cornwall. Um, I am going hopefully to Glasgow for the COP26. And a lot of the, um, the, the debate surrounds financing. Now this afternoon, Durkian, I listened to an IMF podcast about SDRs, just to remind myself just how exciting the whole IMF podcast can be. Uh, not very, but it was very important. They were talking about the $650 billion worth of special drawing rights. Despite everything, Dirk Yan, why is a lot of the financing necessary to get the emerging markets up to vaccination rates that the Western world, the developed world, is experiencing? Why is that financing, A, not forthcoming, or if it is forthcoming, why is it not translating into better vaccination rates? But first, thank you for the question. First, realize how deep the crisis is. And I just want to add a little bit to what Razia was saying about the great divergence, because the Contrast is very, very sharp. Last year saw the broad collapse in per capita income since 1870. And by the end of this year, Sub-Saharan Africa will have regressed to 2007. And the recovery that we see in front of us in low-income countries is both slow, fragile, and uneven. And quite a few of the countries will not return to pre-pandemic levels within the forecast horizon. So uh, uh, often even beyond 2026. And that's really having a major impact. And it's driven really by the vaccine access and the discrepancy is, is enormous. 1.8% of people in low-income countries have had their first dose. In middle-income and high-income countries, that's 82%. There's a huge um, um, spread. The second, the structure of the economy means that uh, low-income countries, because of larger informal sectors, much harder hit. And then thirdly, and here's your financing thing, the ability of the government to actually mitigate the economic impact is very, very limited. So high-income countries were able to uh, generate in fiscal and monetary measures um, a, a package of around 20% of GDP, low-income countries, 2% of the GDP. So bigger impact, a, 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 a much more reduced um, ability to respond. 
And that meant that some of the quite transient impact and uh, what Paul was describing are actually much more sustained and becoming permanent impacts. Permanent impact in unemployment that's being lost. We see it most uh, starkly um, in poverty. By the end of this year, we've got 163 million people additionally in poverty, in extreme poverty. And what we're not counting is people who were already in poverty and have just been pushed much, much deeper into that poverty. So, um, and it's not just poverty and income poverty, people are losing out on, on education. Um, Non-COVID healthcare is being, um, uh, being diverted. And we see systemic risk in terms of debt and conflict. So we are really quite concerned um, about the outlook. And um, the point is, is this, we need to realize that tackling the crisis, the pandemic crisis um, everywhere is a moral imperative. It's also an economic imperative. Um, the uh, Chamber of Commerce, the International Chamber of Commerce uh, calculated that making sure that every, uh, the failure to ensure that everyone is vaccinated is costing, costing the world economy nine trillion US dollars. The, the, the cost to actually vaccinate everyone is minute. It is probably the best investment that we've ever had. And I think it's around this inability to understand that connection. We're both pandemically related to each other, but also economically related to each other. Now, we have a great opportunity, and you've mentioned that, the SDR allocation, special dry, uh, drawing rights allocation of, uh, of 650 billion US dollar that has been made on the 23rd of August. Um, the vast majority of that goes to high and middle income countries. Um, uh, only uh, uh, about 20, 30 billion is going to, 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 to low income countries. But there's now a commitment from the G20 to reallocate about 100 billion of that to low income countries. And the question and the challenge is that's coming up at the GA, but also at the annual meeting, how? How are you going to be reallocating that? What is the vehicle by which this is most effectively being reallocated? Um, and not just how, when? Because if you're going through a long legal process that's going to take a year, that will be time lost. Yeah, absolutely. Um, look, let, let's, let's just... One thing that's has, has really become very obvious already from this conversation is that there is a lack of coordination in the global economic recovery. That, that goes without saying, that the different rates of recovery in some parts, other parts, there is no economic recovery, uh, while the vaccination rates are so appallingly low as well. But is uncoordinated the same as deglobalized? The answer is clearly not. But I do wonder if we are living in a deglobalized world and that is creating problems in the world. So with that in mind, I'm just going to tell the audience now that we have got a poll which is going to come up. Not yet. I'm going to do one more round of questions. But what I want it to do is when we do do this poll, I want everyone to have a little think and vote on this one about whether deglobalization is becoming a prominent issue alongside this lack of coordination we've got. We'll come to the poll in a bit. I'm going to go through the panel one more time quickly, and then we'll come to the poll after that as well. So let me get back to Paul Donovan as well, because you would have looked at this as well, Paul, um, about what we're seeing trans-Pacific as well between the two two greatest superpowers of the 21st century at the moment, economically as well. How dangerous is this deglobalization concept or actually is it not as big a factor as some people are thinking at this moment in time? Um, so to, to give the classic economics answer, it depends. Um, I think there are two forms of, of deglobalization. So one is what I would call you know, active deglobalization. One is more about localization. So deglobalization because of economic nationalism, so you know, President Trump's trade taxes, for example, uh, that is potentially very economically damaging indeed, because what you are doing there is you are forcing businesses out of efficient locations into less efficient locations. That's you know, what trade taxes do all of the time. So that to me is is a real risk because I think we are, for various reasons, seeing the rise of economic nationalism. Uh, it's a very common reaction to periods of structural upheaval and structural change. Uh, it's always very convenient to blame the foreigners. It's very easy to blame foreigners for everything that's going wrong in your country. Um, and so that's a, a, a seductive route for politicians to take. But I think there is also a positive form of deglobalization, which is localization. 
where it becomes more efficient economically and critically environmentally to produce locally. Making clothes to sell in America uh, from Asia is enormously inefficient in an environmental sense because about one third of all clothes in American stores are burnt for fuel because they are never sold. And they're never sold because you've got a six week lead time and you cannot tell a teenager that they cannot get their you know, chosen uh, item of clothing. But if they just wait six weeks, it'll be delivered. You know, as someone who has teenage nieces, I know what the reaction is, and it's not pretty if you ask a teenage girl to wait six weeks before an item of fashion is delivered. So in this world of instant gratification, actually producing closer to the consumer saves an enormous amount of waste. It's more efficient overall, but it, it's requiring uh, robotics automation. It's capital for labor substitution. And that then throws up additional problems because, of course, it's all very well by saying, well, this is better for the planet, better for the economy. It is. But what I'm actually doing is putting capital in the developed world to substitute for labor in the less developed world. And that then has subsequent repercussions, which may well further fuel economic nationalism, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it's a complicated subject. But I think overall, we will see globalization decline. And I think actually part of that economically and environmentally is to be welcomed. But alongside that, we need to have in place some kind of strategy that accepts that whilst this does create a more efficient economy overall, there will be negative consequences that we have to try and work against. Thanks, Paul. A, a very a nuanced answer. But, uh, and again, for, for your uh, teenage nieces, I will trump that with my pre-teenage daughters. That isn't pretty either, I can assure you, the, uh, the, the pressure one that's put under. Razia, um, in terms of what this means, though, if there is a degree of slowing globalisation, and, and as Paul was saying, very mixed, um, some benefits uh, and other things are quite detrimental as well, what does it mean for some of the countries that you've been looking at, of course, that, 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 that actually need this globalisation in order to grow economically and, and to prosper? Well, that's a, a very important point to reflect on, because if we think, first of all, twofold, the confidence that we might have that inflation is just transitory, what we're seeing is very much the impact of the reopening of developed market economies. And yes, there are a few frictions. We know that over the COVID crisis, the peak of it last year, there had been a lot of thinking through just-in-time supply chains and whether that was really going to work or whether there was a better way of doing this. But part of the reason why we can be so confident that inflation will probably revert to the trends that we had seen for the decades in the build-up to the COVID crisis was that we know that greater globalization helps to bring about that price competition. It had very much been a feature of the increase in international trade, the fact that we could look for lower cost suppliers that helped to bring about the inflation, which really did boost prospects for very many around the globe. And then there is the more direct impact in thinking through the very important part of globalization. How is it that we get convergence between different economies over time? How is it that emerging markets are able to grow their way through to greater prosperity, greater levels of wealth? It's through international trade and through being better integrated with the global economy. So the real fear that one might have at this point with a lot of questioning of globalization, this was a trend pre-COVID in a sense, exacerbated very much by the experience of the COVID crisis is, do we see a disruption to that process of globalization that had led to better opportunities for all. And it's very clear, we've seen this in the recovery from COVID so far, even though it is an uneven recovery, even though we haven't seen the same pace of vaccine success the world over, the very fact that some developing countries were able to sell to the developed economies, that they were able to see the benefits of, those, of that trade, that they were able to experience the trade gains, did help in many instances to create better conditions for global growth. So two very important things to think about. The prosperity that we take for granted, the market optimism, are we right in thinking that inflation is just a transient factor? 
That is very much tied into the question of globalization and perhaps the even more important issue that was raised by Paul just now, the fact that so many in developing countries will be reliant on this closer global integration, on deepening trade ties for the emergence of their own prosperity. Dirk Jan, uh, I know you're going to want to follow up on this one as well. The difference between the recovery of high and low income countries. Is there only one route to market for those low income uh, countries now? When I think to the growth opportunities that will occur in the developing world, hopefully uh, with a digital based recovery, hopefully uh, with a greener, um, sustainable recovery as well. Are traditional routes to growth and prosperity, are they still the same ones they were pre-crisis and pre the bigger crisis, well, longer term crisis of climate change? Well, let's look at that. One of the concerns I have at the moment, and we haven't talked about this yet, is the cost of transport that's gone through the roof. Uh, transporting the container from, the, uh, from China to the US has uh, uh, increased 14 fold, right? So if you're an exporter of relatively low value goods, the cost of transport is suddenly becoming a major obstacle to um, growing yourself out of, uh, out of poverty. Oh. Deeply concerned about it, and it's not um, slowing down um, uh, uh, just yet. Um, so that's a major impediment. Can I just come back to a slightly different point that you make on coordination or not? The General Assembly is kicking off uh, this week, right? Um, and so are we lacking coordination and is there a lack of multilateralism that's at the root of this crisis or can we now see a way forward? We saw fantastic work by WHO, IMF, World Bank to come up with a proposal of 50 billion to vaccinate the world, right? Um, uh, Biden has just announced this morning he is convening a summit on COVID-19 as a side event to the General Assembly to do just that. So we re see a resurgence of um, like multilateralism, of collaboration um, in, in the world at this point in time. Um, India reported this morning they're going to restart exporting COVID vaccines, one of the biggest um, facilities of producing uh, um, uh, vaccines are actually in India. So what I'm trying to point to is that collaboration and coordination is the way out, and I see very encouraging signs just this morning on exactly that. What I'm very concerned about is actually about, about this uh, cost of transport uh, that, that we're seeing and other costs that are impacting particularly poor people. Let me make one point on that. We are seeing at this point in time record food prices. Um, they're up 33% versus last year. And if you uh, um, um, look at them in real terms, they haven't been this high in decades. And that is incredibly regressive and impacting the poorest who spend a much larger proportion of their income. On okay. it, 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 so we all talk about inflation, about uh, capital goods, et cetera. Let's look at what it means for the uh, poorest when the cost of food is really go going up. Um, I, 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 would, I just want to remind the viewers, we're going to get to a, a, a poll in a few moments. Paul, can you come back to Dirk Jan on that one as well? You wrote a book on food inflation. You you wrote the book on it as well. And and, and you're saying this isn't real inflation. We are at the end of the Grand Vacances as well. But Dirk Jan there saying record prices, food price. We haven't seen this high in decades. I presume you want to refute that in some way, shape or form. No, in terms of raw food prices, absolutely, the commodities. And this, again, is where inequality comes in. Um, so it comes in within countries and it comes in between countries. In a developed country, the food that you buy is virtually nothing to do with a farmer because there is so much processing that goes on and you, you pay for the advertising, the transport and the distribution and so on. What you are paying for in a developed country when you buy food um, is essentially domestic labor cost. The farmer does not benefit a great deal from what you know, you're spending when you go to Fortnum and Mason, Steve. And I speak as a farmer. Um, in an emerging market, in a developing economy, uh, obviously you are tending to be actually quite a lot closer to the food as a commodity concept. And so this is where we start to see this split coming through. You know, food prices in the UK, retail food prices in the UK are still falling. Um, in spite of the, the commodity prices that Bert Jan's been talking about. Of course, in emerging markets, that's a far more significant problem. And that 
exacerbates the the income inequality that we see. On top of which, of course, as we all know, if you are lower income either within a society or as a country generally, a higher proportion of that income is going on food. So your consumer price basket is obviously differently structured and food prices matter a lot more. So in the United States, in the United Kingdom, in Europe, what Dirk Gann is talking about is not frankly particularly relevant to most people, but in the developing world, absolutely, this is critical. Brilliant. Okay, great answer, and, and, and I'm glad we can find some more questions. Okay, let's get this poll question done. It's on Slido, everybody, uh, and, I, and you can access it via um, your web application, your World Economic Forum application. So I'm asking you the question now, everybody. Deglobalization will become a prominent trend this decade. Do you agree? Are you unsure? Or do you disagree? You've got about 10 seconds, everybody. Deglobalization will become a prominent trend this decade. Do you agree? Number two, are you unsure? Number three, do you disagree? And I'm told it will, uh, it will, it will come up on the screen and we'll be able to see what the results of this are in a few moments' time as well. But uh, we're talking about deglobalization here as opposed to a lack of coordination and a lack of collaboration. And, uh, and I think, uh, just looking, <laughs> it's very small on my screen. I've got Paul very large on my screen. Oh, there we go, that's better. It's as, good, as good as you're looking as you are, Paul. Uh, right, 70% of people, 71%, 73%, uh, uncertain and disagree only at 14 percent as well so i and i think to be honest i would have probably gone for agree as well it's just changed a little bit there's a bit of uncertainty creeping in the longer i talk i think we'll we'll, we'll end that now though but that's very convincing that most of you out there believe um that this will be uh, an ongoing trend does, does anyone want to just follow up on that um does either razia or, or dirk yan um razia why don't you come in on this one worrying trend perspective of developing countries very worrying and I think there's a key theme to touch on here. Paul mentioned it in a sense when we're thinking of building back greener, thinking about how we do things in a much more sustainable manner and the thinking behind this in some quarters that somehow what is more environmentally friendly is about localization, it's about not necessarily bringing in the greater transport costs, that may be one aspect of it. But there is a bigger risk associated with this, and that is if we're going for greater fragmentation of trade, possibly for reasons, a host of other reasons, not necessarily tied to the sustainability idea, that runs the risk that we are taking away from a very significant proportion of the global population the ability to trade their way to greater prosperity. So everything that has worked for populations in decades prior to this, how emerging markets got to where they are today, are those same opportunities going to be open to the frontier markets with a very low trade share as a percentage of their GDP, who are looking perhaps to great, get greater economic complexity, who are looking to change that? So it would be good to drill down as to the reasons for that. But if we are looking at greater fragmentation of global trade, if we are looking at deglobalization, actually that is something that takes away from everyone's prosperity. Okay. Uh Absolutely. Um, let, if I may move on. Um, audience, um, you are allowed to ask questions. You may ask questions. I can hog this. And as Paul, poor man knows from years of being interviewed by me, I will ask all the questions on the planet. Some of them might even be moderately sensible. But please, if you want to ask a question, now is the time to put it in. Our hosts have just reminded me you will get your question. We've got about 10 minutes left as well. Um, so I'll just give you a couple of minutes to get a couple of questions in. But if you don't, I'll just hog it again, and I'll hog it now with another conversation about global debt. I I'm obsessed by many of the emails I get in my inbox, um, but one of them on a regular basis is the IIF Global Debt Monitor. Reassessing the pandemic impact is the latest title that came into my inbox just a few days ago. Some $4.8 trillion was added to the global debt mountain in the second quarter of 2021, bringing it to an all-time high of $296 trillion, the sharpest rise, as many of you may be aware, was in emerging markets, total debt, $91.5 trillion in the second quarter. Dirk Yan, how much of a millstone will this be? in any economic recovery. I know Paul has his views on disinflation or deflation compared with inflation, but at the end of the day, we will see a tapering at some sense. We hope, we think the emergency measures will disappear. When that happens, is this emerging market debt load going to be an enormous break on growth? Dirk Yan. Yes, 
it's really quite problematic. Um, about half the countries are either in debt distress or at high risk of debt distress at the lower end of the um, income spectrum. And so this is one of the biggest problems that we're facing in terms of financing the recovery. If the recovery and the international assistance uh, system has been set up around debt. And if you and it is therefore not um, directed at those countries that need it most, but those countries that are most credit worthy. And almost there is an inverse relationship between them. And if we look at where the money has gone, the international assistance, it hasn't gone to the countries that's had the biggest um, impact in terms of poverty. In fact, it has gone to the countries that has the least impact in terms of rising poverty. So we're not allocating the international resources because we, uh, we are um, um, debt financing um, the, um, um, uh, the international assistance. So um, it, it, we need to look at a much better way of targeting um, because $41 gone to the countries uh, at the um, uh, highest increase in poverty per capita and 108 uh, to countries that had the least impact per capita. And then what we also see a problem of targeting within countries, that people within countries are not getting the assistance um, that, they, that they require. So the high level of indebtedness is a problem. We tried to, to solve it and has been solved for a period of time through the um, uh, debt suspension initiative. But I'm very worried because that is coming to an end by the 1st of January. And so low-income countries will have to st start paying um, interest and principal again from the 1st of January. We've just discovered that they're nowhere near out of this crisis. And so that is coming to a crunch, and it concerns me greatly. Um, I, I just remind everybody that we're, we've, we're in the last five minutes or so here now, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, slightly shorter answers, if I may, on this one. So I'm going to ask Paul and, and Razia the same question in some ways. Paul, we mentioned uh, emerging market debt there uh, with Dirk Jan as well. I mean, the developed market debt is absolutely astronomical in some cases as well. I was just in Italy a couple of weeks ago at the Ambrosetti Forum, and nobody talks about the 160% debt to GDP anymore, whereas 10 years ago, it was all anyone talked about. Nobody even blinks about it these days. Uh, it's all about common issuance and about the, uh, the corona bonds as well. Is it a problem for the developed world as well, Paul? Uh, no, I don't think so. I mean, bear in mind, for most of the 20th century, most countries in the developed world had higher debt-GDP ratios than they have today. Um, uh, the cost of servicing that debt, again, developed world, very, very low. And I think we are moving into a phase where societies are accepting a larger role for government in the economy. If you accept a larger role for government, you accept a larger debt ratio. Uh, and Razia, of course, um, I'm going to tie two issues in one here because one of your bullet points is about the Chinese concerns accelerating. And of course, that is topic du jour as well. I mean, Paul saw on the French. Why don't I carry on as well? The topic du jour as well, because people worried about Evergrande and whether there is a greater corporate debt problem there about financing and servicing and whole host. Does China have a debt problem, Razia, which actually could become something more systemic for markets to worry about? What China does have is the policy tools to be able to ensure that it can restore confidence. It's also an economy that, despite everything, achieved positive growth in 2020 and went on to much stronger growth by the end of the year. So, yes, we are being, seeing that confidence being tested in some respects, but we haven't yet seen the policy measures that China's policymakers might bring to address this issue. That's a key thing to watch. For emerging markets more generally, how worried should we be about the accumulation of debt? Everything depends on growth and the speed with which it comes back. If we are in a growth environment, if the crucial denominator in the public debt ratio is rising, growth is rising, then everyone will worry a little bit less about the accumulated debt for justifiable reasons. And perhaps most encouragingly, we're already starting to see the signs of those fiscal reforms, the reforms that are aimed at reassuring on where debt ratios eventually get to. Brilliant, thank you. Um, I've had a question. Uh, I'm, I'm slightly confused about the question, but it's basically, uh, I think it's saying so we're, we're all just accepting passively that there is a deep globalization going on and we don't have a collaboration outlook 
uh, for common prosperity as well. Is that what we're saying? Turkey, why don't you come in on this one? Are we accepting that deglobalization and a lack of collaboration is actually what's going to happen now? I don't know if we are passively accepting it, are we? But we, we, we're not, neither actively or passively. If you heard the Secretary General on the 10th of September speak on this, he was calling for renewed commitment to multilateralism, exactly because there's so many problems like the pandemic, like, like climate change, that can only result, be resolved collectively. So, uh, no, I think we, we see quite the opposite, um, at least in the quarters where I work and live, um, to really try to find common solutions and coordinated solutions to these major problems that we uh, that we face. I want to just ask you a question. You are working and living in New York at the moment as well. Is there a different attitude with a different administration these days as well? I see the same antagonisms, the same concern amongst allies uh, with the Biden administration, the head with the Trump administration. I see the same trans-Pacific issues in terms of economic rivalry as well. Does anything feel different in New York where you're working, where you're living at the moment? Um, as a UN employee, I should be very careful to make comments uh, uh, or on the political situation in the United States. But I see, like with the um, summit that the Biden administration is just uh, convening, there's a re-engagement um, um, uh, uh, of the United States at this point in time. Uh, but let's leave it at that. Yeah, yeah, beautifully diplomatic. Maybe I'll take this one offline or something. Of course, Doug Yana, we're all going to meet her. Um, right, let's have a, a final round with you three as well. Um, the biggest risks and the biggest uh, opportunities for 2021 as well. Paul, why don't we start off with you? What is the biggest concern you have to your base case scenario? Um, I would argue that for, for the economics, it's probably not the pandemic at this stage, um, uh, because I think that the, um, the fear of the virus, which does most economic damage, has been somewhat contained. My biggest concern is that we get policymakers reacting to structural change, because there is massive structural change going on. We get policymakers rea reacting to structural change as if it was cyclical, because that doesn't help solve the underlying structural problems, and it can make them worse. So my biggest concern is misreading structural change as being a cyclical problem. Um, what is the biggest structural problem, Paul, just very quickly? Uh, I think that the fourth industrial revolution is going to lead to an increase in prejudice in society, economic nationalism, uh, and you need to concentrate on tackling labour market problems to try and contain that as much as possible. Yeah, uh, and, and, and let me just echo your concerns that as well. Of course, we haven't had a chance to talk about a lot of those issues, but you know I share a lot of your views on that one as well. Razia Khan, what are your biggest concerns about society going forward economically now? If we were to grade ourselves on the multilateral response to the COVID crisis, I'm not sure we would be giving ourselves a wonderful assessment. And the bigger issue is really the climate crisis, the climate transition, what needs to be done, what needs to be done around financing. Having got it pretty wrong in the case of COVID, although there is a realization that this situation needs to be improved on, can we really do it that much better when it comes to the environment? Now, you may push back with the idea that perhaps this is something, a risk that lies well into the future. We all know that we don't have the luxury of waiting. The big challenge facing everyone, developed and developing countries alike, can we come together can we have a multilateralism that works for everyone in terms of tackling the climate crisis? Doug Yang, there's an opportunity here as well as risks as well. Do you want to address both of those? Um, absolutely. So I think the risk is that the um, international focus has moved on from the crisis because it's no longer um, uh, top, of the, uh, top of the news. So that the vaccine inequality is not being addressed, that the food price uh, are not being um, addressed, that the SDRs are being very slowly reallocated, and that giving rise to systemic risk. We know that, for example, violent conflict is related to economic contraction, rising unemployment, and uh, having children out of school. At the same time, I see a real opportunity, and I see, I see a real commitment. We convened the world um, just a week ago um, around anticipatory action, and we found that 75 countries made a really true commitment to act of ahead of predictable crisis and that would that instead of waiting for a crisis to happen we're now acting ahead of it and that is a change a systems change that you will hopefully see, uh, see take root
Brilliant. Well, look, um, three fantastic economists giving us lots of different views today. Thank you very much indeed. Of course, real concerns about misreading of what's going on structurally in the global economy and the prejudices that could happen, the policymaker mistakes over uh, tapering. Razia, you raised the issues of concern, but can we do better on the broader climate concerns compared uh, with how we fared uh, on the vaccine distribution and the financing of that one as well. And real opportunities there as well to address these food price issues, these inequality issues as well, vaccine issues as well, highlighted by Dirk Yan as well. Let me thank you all three. Dirk Yan, OMSIC, Chief Economist at the UN Office for Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs. Thank you, sir. Razia Khan, Head of Research, Chief Economist, Africa and Middle East at Standard Charter Bank. Lovely to hear from you again. Thank you very much indeed. And Paul Donovan, thank you, sir. I just want to hasten to add, I haven't been at Fortnum and Mason's in the last 25 years, not since I was a trader. Uh, Global Chief Economist at UBS Wealth Management at UBS AG. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much indeed to the World Economic Forum as well for making this panel possible. That's it from us.